This is always a pleasure. Joined by uh, Alexander Payne, writer director. A couple of Oscars. Well done. Ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> Alexander is here to discuss uh, another film uh, on the list of the most significant political movies of all time, all part of our new limited series, Making Change, culled from the list compiled by the New Republic. Alexander, you've chosen the uh, film, just made it. Comes in at uh, 97. <laughs> Uh, Germany, Year Zero. Weeked in, yeah. Uh, uh, the third film in Roberto Rossellini's uh, war trilogy. Uh, why'd you pick Germany, Year Zero? One of the reasons I picked it is that it's the least known, least seen of his great trilogy. But interestingly, on the New Republic list, neither Rome, Open City, nor Paisan is listed. But this one made it in. I contributed to the list. They asked for my list. I think I put 17 films on. One of them that I included was your film, Election, which is on the list, comes in in the top 20. It didn't occur to me to include any of these films, but all of them are worthy of being on the list. Mr. Rossellini had made two films in the aftermath of World War II and the German occupation of Rome which were immediately of Italy and immediately embraced as masterpieces. And he could have written his own ticket and made any film anywhere. And instead he chose to go even deeper into this aesthetic of witnessing and to take his camera to the belly of the beast, to the eye of the hurricane, to Berlin in 1947. And not to condemn, but to try to understand yeah, and neither to forgive, but as you, the key word, you used the exact right word, just to witness. To understand how yeah. can this great people of a great and prosperous nation, how could they have been led so politically astray as to have visited annihilation, not just on others, but upon themselves? Yeah, if ever there is a movie, or certainly three movies, that, that, that examine the, the dire consequences of fascism, I mean, here it is, this is... This is what you're left with. This is the ruins of fascism. Right, and he arrived in Berlin, I think in February, March of 47, yeah. and drove across the city and realized immediately that the city itself is a metaphor, a city in ruins, basically a Martian landscape. And so in applying his realistic view and his unblinking, let's say, camera, that immediately he can capture a metaphor. Yeah. And the story he tells here, though, from the point of view of a 12-year-old child, this is a unique form of storytelling and clearly meant something particular to Rossellini. Right. We can get into the personal reason in a moment, but to make an anti-war film, you don't need to show soldiers and war is hell and crash, crash, boom, boom. You can do it uh, studying the face of a child, of an innocent, who is uh, an unwitting victim of this complete moral morass. And occupation authorities have put, you know, they, they found apartments that are livable and these, and so five families are living in this one apartment because it's, things are working there. Right, right. And it just has turned everyone against everyone else. You know, the, the people forced to take in all these tenants are angry at the tenants and the tenants resent the guy who has taken them in. Again, to me, it's the, it's, these are the repercussions of fascism. Everyone's living just to survive. And the film isn't just about this boy and being an orphan, but I mean, the whole, the whole thing is heartbreaking. Yeah, it's all heartbreaking. And, and, and again, what you said at the beginning that, you know, the, this is not to condemn or vilify, but also not to forgive. It's just like, here it is. This and is to remind future, you know, he's making a film for the moment, but he's also making a document for the future. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to show this film is it's pretty hard to watch without thinking about poor kids in Gaza or in Syria or in the Ukraine. Of course. The same damn thing is happening. And in the casting, and this is a, a typical Rossellini film in this way, that none of these actors were working professional actors. But the kid was an, an acrobat. acrobat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he saw this kid and thought right away, like, oh, he has something. Do you want to mention the personal reason? No, I think it's important before people see it that yeah. you keep this in mind. Yeah, and because they'll, they'll see it at, at the beginning. This film is dedicated to the memory of my son, Romano Rossellini. Right. Uh, and, and so what, what's Romano's story? Romano had died the year before at age nine of peritonitis yeah. from his appendix. Yeah, and on the operating table. Like and that. Rossellini was devastated, understandably devastated. And that urge, I think both to honor his son, but also 
because his son possibly had also been a victim of a lack of medical, proper medical attention, again brought on by the war, that uh, to center his next work on the face of a child was important to him. All right, we'll speak uh, more after the movie. Alexander Payne, thanks very much. Uh, here it is from director Roberto Rossellini in 1948, Germany, year zero. I'm back here with uh, Alexander Payne. He uh, chose the film we just saw, part of our series, Making Change, the 100 most significant political films of all time. So that's a sudden and abrupt ending, but I suppose the, probably from the moment that Rossellini undertook the project, he was, I imagine, a little bit working backwards. He sort of knew this was how it was going to end. You can't see it completely as a bummer, though, because he's, I mean, think of the title of the film, Germany Year Zero. Right. That means things start now. And yes, on an immediate story level, it's a total bummer that, you know, what, what the child does, killing his father and then killing himself. But there's a, allow me a symbolism sure. that, that something is going to die so that something new can be reborn. Right. And if there is Christian imagery in the film, the fact that he's, the boy is lying there on the ground and a woman comes kind of like Mary for a final kind of pieta composition that leads us into the ending there. It's a downer, but there it's not without hope. Yeah. We know that the young child has already taken the poison with the intent of, you know, doing what both Mr. Henning said to do and what the father had said himself, right? That he's, right. you know, that his life is, he'd be better, he'd better serve everyone uh, if he were dead. The father meant to the family and Mr. Henning meant to the state, right? Um, but when his father is going on and on and on about how much, you know, how much of a burden he is to the family, I thought I would poison him just to end this conversation, <laughs> right? I, I thought yeah. it was my one moment of like, okay, you know what, it's time, let's go. Right, yeah. right, right. Well, it's an example too of the part of the point of the film is is that the, when there's a amoral, completely corrupt uh, system of values, good people do bad things thinking they are doing good things. That's right. Rossellini said that the whole film was conceived specifically for the scene with the child wandering on his own through the ruins. I only felt totally sure of myself at this decisive moment. Well, I think that's right. I think it mirrors what he himself, Rossellini, felt taking in the rubble of Berlin, of this once great city. And to watch the kid, an innocent, walking through this material and moral wasteland is kind of the point of the film. I mean, often when you make a film, it's like, oh, I can't wait to get to the scene where, because that encapsulates kind of the whole film in a nutshell, or is gonna really speak to me and then by extension to the audience. And it's just showing that city. By the way, I wanna put in a good word too for a companion piece to this film, which is Billy Wilder's A Foreign Affair. Pretty much the same year and also shot in the rubble of Berlin. They're completely different films, but they're companion pieces because they're both about varieties of moral depravity in the wake of fascism. Yeah. You earned an Oscar nomination for your film, Election. Wonderful movie, by the way. Thank it's you, on thanks. the list, uh, and if anybody hasn't seen it out there, they should see it immediately. Reese Witherspoon, Matthew Broderick, among others. So was there any hesitancy about the title, even though it's about a high school election? Yes. The head of marketing at Paramount said in a meeting, I can't market a movie called Election. And he was right. Is that right? Yeah, didn't, it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't do very well that year. It's, it's gotten a pretty good reputation since, but, but it didn't make much money with the year it came out. Yeah, it's got a great reputation since, obviously. But the, uh, uh, I mean, could you see, is, was there another title that might have worked no, better? No, we, we yeah. liked that title. It seemed fine. Right, it seemed fine, yeah. yeah. Alexander, thank you uh, Thank you, much. Ben. As always, it's, uh, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thanks. Alexander's done for the night, but of course, the political films continue right here on TCM, and as always, they are uncut and commercial-free. Next on TCM, Gabriel over the White House, then Battleship Potemkin, and later, the fog of war. The stakes are high on TCM Tonight.